Yesterday, my sister had a birthday, and so it got me to thinking about some things from when we were growing up, and I started to think back, and it's crazy the things that you remember that you haven't thought about for years, but all of a sudden, when you just take some time to think about growing up, that, that you remember, and I haven't thought about this for years, but yesterday as I was thinking about my sister, a memory came up, and my sister would, would occasionally perform shows around the house, and I wouldn't really know what to do with myself, so sometimes I would just interrupt the shows, and sometimes she would play along, and other times she would be really mad at me, and I just never really knew how that would go. Well, she was over at a friend's house, and I went with my mom to pick her up after they were done playing together, and they had put together a show, and so they were, they were performing their show, and I got really bored as little brother's tend to do. And so as they were performing their show, I decided that I was going to be the vendor in the crowd. I don't know why. I've always been a weird guy. I don't know what to tell you. But in the middle, in the middle of their show, I was going around the room screaming, popcorn, get your popcorn here. And my sister's looking at me like, what are you doing? And her friend has no idea what I'm doing. She has no idea what I'm doing. And she's looking at me like, what are you doing? And rather than stop, I just keep adding different, different flavors of popcorn. So it just started with popcorn, and then it was caramel corn, and then it was cheese popcorn. All of that was available, and I just kept throwing all of that out there. And my sister is just looking at me like, you are the weirdest guy ever, which may be true. But the fact of the matter is she knew exactly what I was doing because she had seen me do it before. But I'd never done it in front of others. I'd never done it in front of other people. And so what she would sometimes play along with at home, there was a different standard because other people were involved. So we would act one way at home, but a different way when other people were there. And that's a lesson that we all have to learn in life. All of us learn that lesson at some point in life, that we can act one way at home, but then we have to act another way when other people are present. And it's a lesson that the church in Corinth also had to learn. And that's what we're going to look at today as we continue our look at 1 Corinthians 14. So if you have your phones or your tablets, follow along on your Bible apps at home as we go and dive into 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 1, where we read these words. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Now, we've talked a lot about this the past few weeks. We've talked about gifts and how God gives all of us talents, gifts, and abilities, and they're unique. They're different. They're not all the same. And that's by God's design, that we aren't all wired the same way, that God wires us differently for his plan and his purpose. And last week, we looked and we saw the importance of love. Last week we saw how greater than everything is love. That love is the greatest thing. It is the thing that lasts. It is what God uses to define his nature. And love stands the test of time. Love lasts. So what we see right here is this continuation of these themes. Desire, desire the gifts. Desire the gifts and pursue love. Now, what pursuit says is pursuit says it's up to us. When we pursue something, that is dependent upon us. We have to put in the work. We have to put in the effort to pursue something. Pursuit, it's up to you. It's up to me. Love is our responsibility. That is up to us. We are the ones who have to pursue it. That's our job. That's our role. Our role is to go and to pursue something. That means we have to chase after it. We have to work towards it. It is a pursuit. It's on us. Desiring gifts is something differently entirely. That's not dependent upon us. Receiving a gift is not dependent upon the recipient. It's dependent upon the giver. And that's why we've talked, never be upset with the gift that God has given you. Never be upset with the way that God has wired you. It's not up to you. It's up to the one who gives you a gift. And some of you have learned this at birthdays or Christmases, the hard way, because you've given a thousand hints. You've let everybody know exactly what you want. 
and they're just not getting it. And so you wake up with anticipation and expectation. Like today's the day. You're going to get exactly what you wanted. And it ends poorly because somewhere that message was lost in translation. We've all been there. I remember one year for Christmas, I had no idea what to get my dad. I had no idea what to buy my dad for Christmas. And so I made the mistake of asking my mom, hey, mom, you know dad better than anybody in the world. What should I get him for Christmas? She thought about it for a minute and said, you know what your dad's been really wanting? I'm like what? A scale. I went and I bought the man a scale for Christmas. A scale to measure his weight. I went and I bought him one for Christmas. And I watched his face as he opened the package and said, thanks, son. You got me a scale. And I wanted to throw my mom under the bus. I'm like, I didn't know what to get you. Mom told me to get you a scale. I had no idea. Anybody who's ever received a disappointing gift understands that getting a gift is not dependent upon the person who receives it. It's dependent upon the giver. And so it is with the way that God has gifted us. With the talents, the gifts, and the abilities that we have, it's not up to us. They're up to God. But love, love is up to you and I. It's our obligation. It is up to us to pursue that. That's on us. And then he continues. Especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Now we're going to tear this apart today, but understand at, at just the foundational level what we, what we need to build off of. And that, that is this, that there were some people in Corinth, in the church, who were trying to impress other people by how spiritual they were. They were trying to impress other people by how spiritual they were. And so they were using some of the spiritual gifts in order to accomplish this. They wanted everybody to think that they were more spiritual than anybody else, and so they were using a couple of the spiritual gifts in order to facilitate that. And one of those gifts was the gift of tongues. Now, tongues had two primary outlets. One is a personal prayer language, And the second is a supernatural ability to speak foreign languages. Not that you've taken the time to learn and to speak in a foreign language, but just God in a supernatural way would enable somebody to speak a foreign language to communicate with somebody else. Prophecy, in a general sense, is proclamation. It's talking. It's proclamation. It's preaching. It's advancing a message. And in a specific sense... It's a supernatural gift given by God for somebody to look in and foresee the future. Now, understand, you had to be very, very careful with this, especially in the Old Testament, because Deuteronomy 18.20 tells people that if you prophesy and it does not come true, you're to be killed. So you don't get, you don't get more than one chance to be wrong, and if you're wrong, you're dead So if you're telling people you have a message from God, it better come true or else you're dead. Those are the stakes. And then he continues in verse 4 when he says these words. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Let me read those verses again. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. All the spiritual gifts, not just these two, but all the spiritual gifts were designed by God with the goal that they always advance the fame and the cause of Jesus, not the individual. 
All the gifts that God has given us, the goal is to advance the cause and the fame of Jesus, not us individually. It's never about us personally. It's never about the person. It's always about the kingdom of God. It's always, always, always about Jesus. And God has given all of the gifts, and he's given us unique gifts and different gifts to advance his cause, not for individual credit or fame. But it's always, always, always to advance his purposes. Now, before 2020, completely lost its mind with everything that's been going on with the coronavirus. We got a prequel of how awful the year was going to be with the death of Kobe Bryant. And I don't know if you saw yesterday, it was announced that Kobe Bryant's going into the Basketball Hall of Fame, as he should. But there's a tragedy about the career of Kobe Bryant. As great as a player as Kobe Bryant was, as phenomenal of a basketball player as Kobe was, he never achieved all he could. In the prime of Kobe's career, he had a teammate, for those of you who don't follow basketball. Kobe Bryant was a basketball player for the Los Angeles Lakers. And in the prime of his career, he played with another superstar named Shaquille O'Neal. You probably know Shaq. You've seen him on commercials. Just a monster of a man, a huge force. And in his prime, he could not be stopped. And he was paired on a team with Kobe Bryant. But there was a problem. They hated each other. They didn't want to share the spotlight. They didn't want to share the basketball. They didn't get along. And as a result of Shaq and Kobe's inability to get along, as a result of them not working well together as a team, each of them retired. Did they win some championships? Yes. They were all all stars, both MVPs. But each of them retired with fewer rings than they should have. Because as great of a player as Kobe was, and as great of a player as Shaquille O'Neal was, they couldn't figure out how to work together. It was always about them wanting to be the biggest deal. It was always about them wanting to score the most points. It was always about them wanting to get all the accolades. And their inability to work together well as a team caused both of them to retire with fewer championships than they should have. And so it can be in the church and in our relationships where we try to elevate ourselves We try to make ourselves the central focus when we want everybody to look at us rather than what God is doing. And if that's true of our legacy, then the sad fact is we don't retire with fewer rings, with fewer championships than we otherwise should have. The sad fact for us is that God chooses to do things through others and not allow us to be used by him to his fullest advantage. The church is never about a person. The church is never about one person or one gift. God didn't design it that way. He designed us to need each other, to be invested and engaged in one another's lives, and to complement each other. That is the design by God. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, 
how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So he says, if I show up and I speak to you in a language that nobody understands, what good is that? What good is that? It's not helping anybody. If I show up and I speak a language that nobody understands, it doesn't further the cause of the church. It's not doing anybody any good. That's not the point. And he says, if the flute and the harp aren't playing their specific notes, if they aren't playing in harmony, it sounds chaotic. I have a question for those of you at home right now. Now that everybody in the world's homeschooling, how many of you are regretting the fact that you made your kids sign up for band? How many of you hate the fact that right now you're having to listen to that all because you thought it'd be a really good idea for you to learn an instrument? Be careful what you wish for because you've just now gotten it. And he says that the flute and the harp, if they don't play in harmony, if they don't play the right notes, it's chaotic. It's horrible. And if the bugle plays the wrong notes, it doesn't move anyone to anything. And if you're walking in with your own agenda and trying for everybody to notice you and see how spiritual you are, you distract from the ultimate purpose and the ultimate cause. It's always about Jesus. It's never about us. It's always about Jesus. It's never about us. So with yourselves, if your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none, without, none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager to, for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Be on the same page. Build up the church. It's always about the collective. It's not about the individual. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Now here he's referencing the specific prayer language that God gives to people in the gifts of tongues. It's an experience. It's an experience for people. It is something that draws that individual closer to God, but it's a private experience between the person and God. And it's a spiritual experience. But just remember, he says, that God wants you to worship in spirit as well in truth. That's what John 4.24 tells us, that God wants you to worship in spirit as well as truth. So he says, if this is your gift, it isn't wrong to use it, but don't rely on solely that. It isn't wrong to use that gift if God's given you that gift and it helps you connect with him spiritually, but don't rely solely on that. Pray also in ways that you understand so that you are worshiping God in spirit as well as in truth. He continues in the passage. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. He says, if you have the gift of tongues, 
Anybody encountering this has no clue what you're doing. They have no idea what's going on. They think you've lost your mind. They simply do not know what's going on and what you're doing. It brings about confusion and uncertainty. People don't know what's happening. And so our approach here at Lakeside, our approach here at Lakeside is verse 19. Our approach at Lakeside is to build up everyone. That's our desire. Our desire is to build up everyone, to keep the focus on Jesus, to proclaim his fame, and not to shine a spotlight on any one person, but instead in all that we do to proclaim Jesus. And so we just opt. We say, hey, we're going to opt for the five clear words. We're going to opt for the five clear words versus the 10,000 words that people do not understand. When we meet together, we are going to build up each other. We are going to advance the cause and the fame of Jesus. Now, different people have different convictions regarding these spiritual gifts. And that's perfectly all right. Some people are like, hey, God ceased giving them. They were for a time and for a purpose. Other people are like, no, 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 no. God still gives them to get today. And we're just not going to get involved in that fight with anybody. But our approach is going to be this, that we're going to choose to build up each other. We're going to choose the five intelligible words versus the 10,000. And if you believe in your heart and you are convinced that God has given you the gift of tongues and you pray to God and that enhances you spiritually, that is fantastic. But just understand, when we get together, we choose, we choose to advance the cause for all. That's our choice because it's never about the individual. And that doesn't mean that we think your gift isn't important. It doesn't mean that we don't think you're important. But what it means is we always, always, always advance the cause for all and not the individual. Then it continues in verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Essentially what he's saying is this. He wants every follower of Jesus to be innocent, but not naive. He wants every follower of Jesus to be innocent, but not naive. We've all seen the stereotypes of the naive Christian. We've seen them propagated in film and in pop culture. And frankly, they're, they're there for a reason. Because some people take this call to innocence and just bury their head in the sand. And think that by being naive, they're advancing what God has called them to be. And that's not the case. We as people who follow Jesus have never been called to be people who are naive. We have been called to be people who are innocent. And why does, he, why does he bring this about in the midst of all this conversation about spiritual gifts and in the midst of all this conversation about not trying to one-up the, the purpose of the church to advance your singular gift? Why does he talk about the importance of being innocent, but not naive. Because he wants us to understand this. That whatever the gifting that you have is from God, whatever gift God has given you, whatever that gift happens to be, God wants your life to match your message. God wants our lives to match our message. It's easier to proclaim a message than it is to always live it out. But that's not the point. The point is God wants your life 
to match your message. He wants the message that you proclaim and the message that we rally around, the hope of Jesus. He wants that to be a defining characteristic in your life, not just words that you speak. In the law it is written, be people of, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. God uses all gifts to further his purposes, but some are better used personally, in private, in specific ways and in specific conversations, in specific outlets than others. And then he says this in verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare, God is really among you. And this is our aim at Lakeside, that we would proclaim the name of Jesus that we would see people's lives changed by the hope of Jesus. And he just says, you're going to encounter people who don't know Jesus. And when you do, when you encounter people who don't know Jesus, Make it so them when they walk in and they join you. They don't scratch your heads. They don't think, what are these crazy people doing? Now, this doesn't mean that we can put God in a box. And it doesn't mean that we can easily define every time that God works and God moves. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is that when we're together, we choose to build up each other. We choose to proclaim the name of Jesus and make that the central focus of what we do. And sometimes that means that personally, the gifts that God has given us, we put on the back burner a little bit we don't exercise them in front for all to see. Because it can be counterintuitive. And that's not us saying that. That's God saying that. Through Scripture. The one who gave you that gift. He's the one telling you, use it but do so when the circumstances are right. So what does all this mean for us? And why does this, why does this matter? Well, first, at Lakeside, we, we are just driven by this desire. We are driven by the desire that we want to make the message of Jesus as easy as possible for people to understand. Without apology, we want to make the message of Jesus as easy as possible for people to understand. That is what drives us. It is what we want to do. We want to help people understand the message of Jesus to the best of our ability in the easiest possible way. That's our desire. Second, we bring about the greater good. When we get together, we do so to encourage everybody. 
we do so to spur each other on towards love and good deeds as we're called to do. But we keep Jesus as the central focus. We do not build ministry around a person or a team of individuals. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. So we strive to be a place that people who don't know Jesus can come and learn about Jesus in a way that is easy for them to understand so that they can make the decision to follow him. And we exist as a community. The desires for every person to use the gifts that God has given them. Not for them to get noticed, but for the cause of Jesus to be advanced. For his glory. It's always about the greater good, and that is the message of Jesus. So wherever you're gifting, however you have talents and abilities, make sure that they're used. But make sure their use is ultimately Proclaim the fame of Jesus. God, I pray that we would be people who help those who are far from you enter into a relationship with you. I pray we'd be people who come together as a great team Realizing it's never about one of us. God, I pray you'd work in this place. That we could proclaim the message of hope to those who are hopeless. We would be a church of people who come together however they're gifted. And say, we want to proclaim the message of Jesus. God, that you would work through us, around us, and in spite of us for your glory. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.